stay together. Father, we thank you 
that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Father, if the resurrection is true, and it is, yes. then that changes everything. Yes. He is everything that He claimed to be. He is priest and king. Yes. He is prophet. He is creator of God. He is the Savior of all mankind. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. So, Father, we thank You that You verified that everything Jesus ever said He claimed was true. And You verified that on Resurrection morning. Father, as we prepare our hearts today and all this next week for Easter Sunday, I pray, Father, that we might stand afresh in awe of our Lord, King, and Savior and what He did on the cross. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to take just a moment to uh, tell you what we're doing today. We're going to have the Lord's table. We're going to observe that. And we'll be doing that at the end of the service. So the message today, during the message today, we ask everyone that uh, you would just be preparing your heart as we think about what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us on the cross that makes it possible that if we have believed on Him, we can take of the Lord's table. So we'll be doing that at the end of the service. And, and while I'm on that subject here, we do have some guests here today, and we are glad of that. And I want to tell the guests that are here that we have an open table. And, and when it comes time for the communion, then you, if you know that you know, everyone that's here today, whether you're a member of Bel Air or whether you're a guest, if you know that you're saved, that you've given your life to Jesus, if you're living for Him and not in rebellion, you're living for Him the best you know how, and you've been baptized, then you're more than welcome to partake of the Lord's table today. And we're looking forward to being able to do that with you. If the guys would come forward, uh, I do want to take a moment to welcome our guests. And uh, we are so thrilled that you're here. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's your first time or second, third, or fourth time. If you're here today and you're a guest, you are honored us by being here. We have prayed for you all week. We have tried to prepare for you. And our prayer at Bel Air is always that our guests are encouraged from the moment they set foot on our campus to the moment that they leave and then that you'll come back. So we're glad that you're here today. If you're a guest, we'd like to ask you to do one thing for us, and that's on the right-hand side of your worship bulletin. There's a tab that provides a place for you to fill out a little information about yourself. If you could do that, tear it off, drop it in the offering plate when it comes by. That's all we'd ask of you. But these guys standing here, and there's one in the balcony, would like to give you a gift for being our guest today. It's a, a gift package from the church. It has a pen in case you need something to write on that tab with. And uh, if you just slip your hand up there, just do that right quick, they'll get it into your hands. Would you do that? Slip it up. Come on, let's go. Keep it up. These guys have a hard time seeing it. All right. Thank you so much for being so kind to do that. Up in the balcony, we get everybody don't want to miss anyone. So glad that you're here today. Hey, listen, I want to do one thing real quick. We're, we're a family here. Amen? Amen? Sometimes families have to have a little heart-to-heart -heart talk. There's way too much movement in our worship services. Too many people come here to one worship, and sometimes you don't mean to, but you can distract their worship experience if you get up and going out near and hurry critical moments. Now, we value everybody that comes to worship here. We, we just value you. We want you to come. But if you've got a medical condition that you know that you're going to have to be leaving the service once or twice every week, sit near the back so you don't disturb people. And if you know that you've got a medical condition or, or you've got to go to the restroom, try to do that with singing before the message starts because it's a lot less to, distractive, you know. But, you know, if you have to go, you have to go, you know. We don't want to. <laughs> we don't want you to sit here in misery. <laughs> but we need to have respect that what we're getting ready to do, as soon as I shut up and sit down, is to seek to have an encounter with the living God. We want to respect that, and we want to respect everybody else that's there. And, and thank you for being patient and kind of understanding that I, I had to say that.
blessed Holy Spirit, worship your Son, and give thanks to you for all that you have given to us. And at this time, as we go back a portion of what you have given us, let us remember that it is just that, a portion, a tiny portion. Give us every breath, give us every ray of sun that we crop upon, all the green that grows, all the food we eat, all the care we give. But even more importantly than that, Father, you give us life. You give us life twice. We get what we're born from our mothers and again we were born in the spirit. We thank you for that. Thank you for our births. And we just pray that you will keep your hand on all of us forever. And that we will sing your praises until long after time has died. Thank you.
place. I'd rather go worship the Lord than right here. And we have such gifted people to take us in the presence of God every week. If you haven't done so, would you please turn in your copy of God's Word to John chapter 19, verse 30. And would you stand with me as we honor the reading of the Word of the living God. For the benefit of our guests, we have been for the last four weeks looking at different sayings of Jesus from the cross. This is our fourth saying that we've looked at today. We find it in verse 30 of 19th chapter of John. And the Word of God says, Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, He said, It is finished. And He bowed His head and gave up His spirit. Would you pray with me? Father God, this is your bride. The one that Jesus Christ died for. Father, your bride has assembled together today. And together, Father, we join as one heart and one mind. And we say to you, come thou fount of our blessing. Come thou prince, come thou king. Come thou Jesus, come thou Holy Spirit. Fill this place. Inhabit the praise and the hearts of your people. And help us, Father, to speak your word clearly. Help us, Father, to hear it with ears that hear and eyes that see and hands and feet that obey. Father, I pray, O Spirit, that you would come. And for every heart that's here that's not fully given over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that during this time you would reveal that to them, draw them to Jesus. Father, for those who are not saved, would you save them? Father, for those who are in rebellion, would you bring them home? And Lord, whatever you do, Father, we pray that you would lift up our mighty Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's His glory that we pray these things. And the bride of Jesus Christ said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> Brenda and I bought a bunch of canned vegetables a year or so ago when they were on sale. It's hard to find anything on sale anymore this year of Congress. But a year or so ago, they had a lot on sale. We buy them by the case. And I have them in a room of our house, and I have expiration dates written on the various cans so that we make sure that we uh, eat them before they expire. I walked in the laundry room, and I saw all those cans and thinking about the message this week, and it dawned on me that each and every one of us have an expiration date. We all have an expiration date. There is a time that everyone here today will come to the end of your life. Now, you don't have to tell that to someone who's fighting cancer or heart disease. Someone that maybe, like two of our beloved church families, have a member that are now on hospice. They know better than most of us that they have an expiration date. And there's a way that you can look at their situation and say, you know, in a way, they're blessed. They're blessed in that you and I may not know we may not be fortunate enough to know exactly when we're going to transition from this life to the next life. But regardless of whether we know or don't know, regardless of whether our expiration date is soon or many years away, whenever we get there, the unavoidable question in our life is going to be this. Did I finish what God wanted me to do? Did I finish what God set out for me to do in this life? You could say it negatively, I guess. Did, how much did I leave unfinished? Well, as we come to the Word of God today, we see that Jesus, at His last moment of life, gave out a triumphal cry of victory, and His triumphal cry of victory was the words, It is finished. Only Jesus could say these words with absolute truthfulness. Only Jesus could die without a single regret because Jesus died with the satisfaction on the cross of knowing that He had completely fulfilled everything, completely fulfilled the purpose for which He had been born. 
Actually, the word that's in your English translation being translated, it is finished, is one word in the Greek. In the Greek text, it's one word. It is telestai. Telestai. It comes from the Greek verb teleo. And the Greek verb teleo, that telestai that Jesus uttered on the cross comes from, it means to end. It means to complete, to accomplish. It means to successfully come to the end of a race. So shouting telestai, Jesus gave the most triumphant cry that's ever been heard in all of human history. Oh, brothers and sisters, it's the cry that the whole creation had been longing and yearning to hear ever since the curse fell on the created order in the Garden of Eden. And Jesus' triumphal cry comes to us today. And for every one of us here, it just begs a question of us. And the question that this cry begs is, well, what was finished? When Jesus cried, it is finished. What was it? That he had finished. Well, first of all, it meant, this cry meant that Jesus' suffering was finished. Jesus was born to suffer. His crib, think about it for a moment. His crib wasn't in a palace fit for a king. His crib was a feeding trough for the animals. And straw was the pillow for his newborn head. Jesus always, throughout all of his ministry, he said, don't you know I have to be about my father's business? Jesus was always about the father's business, and the father's business for Jesus would primarily include him paying the price for your and my redemption. Jesus' job description called for suffering. In fact... When you go to the Old Testament and Isaiah, probably more than any other one individual prophet, Isaiah prophesied much about this, this coming Messiah. And Isaiah talked about the one that would come and he explained to us that he would be the suffering servant. I want you to think a minute about the suffering that Jesus experienced. The religious authorities wanted to stone him Others came forward and falsely accused him. His hometown citizens even got together and conspired to throw him over a cliff. And can I tell you today that the rejection hurt like a knife. But that was finished now. The secular powers of Rome cared absolutely nothing about what Jesus believed or claimed to be. The rulers were absolutely unfazed by his claim to kingship. And the injustice of it stung Jesus like a loss. But that was finished now. His disciples, those who were the closest to him of anybody on earth, his disciples backed away from him. When their commitment to him became costly, they all fled away from him and left him alone. When Jesus needed them the most, they deserted him. And then one who claimed to be his friend, who had shared his bread and shared his campfire for three years, then one of his own Judas came forth. And with a symbol that's supposed to signify love and affection, with a kiss, he betrayed the Lord. Can I tell you that the disciples cared us and the betrayal of Judas brought sadness to the heart of Jesus? <coughs> but that was finished now. And at the scene of the crime, the worst crime that humanity has ever perpetrated, long spikes of thorns were woven into a crown and they were pressed deep into the skull of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was tied to a pole and lacerations came raining down on His body and chunks of meat was being ripped from His back from cat of nine tail whips. He staggered under the weight of the cross as He made His way to Golgotha. Nails were driven through His wrist and they were driven through His feet. And we think of the crucifixion and all the pain and all the cruelty and we remember the worst cruelty of all that He had to suffer separation from the Father when He bore our sins. That was finished now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm so thankful. When my Lord cried these words that Jesus' suffering had come to an end. 
But you know, as I come to the Word of God today, I want to also praise God while we who have given our life to Jesus as His followers, even though we may suffer now, you can take courage today that one day because of Jesus, you can shout that cry too. It is finished. Yeah. My suffering is over. One day we too shall be able to stand on the other side of this life and cry. It is is finished. Sometimes trouble comes to us as believers of the Lord and Satan tries to get us discouraged. But brothers and sisters, you're not saved for this life. You're not saved for this moment. Whatever your circumstances may be, no matter how much you may be suffering, no matter what the trial in your life is, you are not saved for this moment. That's why Paul says in Romans 8, verse 24, he says, For in hope you have been saved. Did you hear that? Yes. For hope you have been saved, but hope which is seen is not hope. For who hopes for that which you already see? But if we hope for that which we do not see, then with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Brothers and sisters, that day is coming. You just need to hang on. And I say to the woman who's here today, and your husband has mistreated you, hang on. Yeah. To the woman or the spouse today who's been betrayed by your spouse, hang on. Mm -hmm. To the person here who's suffering from cancer, and heart disease. You just need to hang on to those who are grieving the loss of a loved one. And many here have. I have no idea how many funerals I've done at this church in the last five years and you're still grieving for the loss of a loved one. You just need to hang on yeah. to all here today who are weak and wounded by the sins and the trials of this life. I say that one day you'll be able to say with Jesus it is finished. Jesus' suffering has ended now. But the second thing that Jesus also had finished was that His sacrifice was finished. His sacrifice was finished. You know, in Old Testament time, the people wondered. They wondered when their sacrifices would be finished. All the Old Testament saints who died in faith, they all died believing that the last payment for their sins was yet to be paid. In fact, the whole, the entirety of the Old Testament sacrificial system taught them that. In the Old Testament, you see the saints, were, the priests rather, were never allowed to sit down while they were on duty. They were always standing, always standing, never sitting. Do you know why they never sat? Because their sacrifices had never been completed. There was an endless work to be done for them. There was an endless stream of sacrifice day after day, hour after hour, week after week, year after week, an endless sacrifice of animals because animals could not cleanse the conscience of the people. And then we come to the New Testament. We come to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and we find out in the New Testament that Jesus was both not just a sacrifice, He was the high priest also. He was both priest and sacrifice. And Jesus made the payment for my debt. Jesus took my spiritual bankruptcy and He offered it with His solvency. That's why the writer in Hebrews wrote these following words of admonition for us. In Hebrews 9 verse 11, listen to what he says. He says, but when Christ appeared not as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered the greater and more perfect tabernacle, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. We see that Jesus was both priest and sacrifice. He came with His own blood. He entered the holy place once for all. Having obtained eternal redemption for if the blood of bulls and goats for the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer sprinkled on those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh. I love these words. Amen? Amen. Say them with me. How much more? Yeah. Amen? How much more? Well, the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, cleanse your 
conscience from then work to serve the living God. I love those words. My most favorite words in Scripture is how much more? How much more? You know, in the ancient times when the price of a purchase for an item had been made in full, when there was no longer any outstanding debt that was due for that outstanding purchase, do you know what they wrote on the bill of sale? They wrote the word that Jesus cried from the cross. They wrote the word, Telesta! Paid in full. <coughs> it is finished. Jesus paid every last cent of my wages of my sin. And God wrote on my bill in heaven, on my account, and on your account if you're saved today, He wrote, Telesta! Paid in full. Amen? That's good news. Paid in full. <laughs> of Jesus Christ has been successfully credited to my account. Brothers and sisters, there's nothing left for me to pay. There's nothing left for you to pay. And we think back again to the Old Testament how on the Day of Atonement the high priest would take a goat that was called the scapegoat and on the day of atonement, when the sins of the people were atoned for, the high priest would lay his hands on that goat. And as he laid his hands on the goat, he would, he would confess the sins of the people on the head of that goat. And the sins of the people were legally transferred to the head of that goat. And then that goat was taken out into the wilderness and set free and that goat was never seen again. Aren't you glad today that God promises in Hebrews chapter 10, 17, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Yeah. Amen. It is finished, Jesus said. My sacrifice, I paid everybody's <coughs> sin. Jesus paid it all. Brothers and sisters, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it. Why, that snow. His suffering is ended now. His sacrifice is finished now. The payment for my sin debt was finished, praise God. But thirdly, what else was finished? The defeat of Satan. Your and my enemy was finished. The defeat of Satan was finished. Jesus said, it is finished. And when He said it, He also meant that the seed of the woman had triumphed over the old serpent from the garden. When He said it is finished, He was saying what He said in John 12, 31. Jesus said, Now judgment has come upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Let me tell you something. If you're being plagued by Satan today, if you're being enslaved by Satan today, if you're being wooed and, and cajoled by Satan today, you're only there because you want to be there. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ cast out the ruler of this world. Yeah. At the cross, there was a great cosmic battle being fought. And there was three people, three persons represented at Calvary. Oh, you can believe the devil was there. The devil was there doing his best work, or so he thought. The devil was there throwing out both barrels of everything he had. Jesus Christ was there paying every drop of mine in your sin penalty. And brothers and sisters, you and I were there. Yeah. We were there. Listen to how Paul, he tells us this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Watch and we see all three of us there in this Word of God. Paul said, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He being Jesus made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of death consisting of decrees against us which were hostile to us. He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Yeah. And when he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, that's Satan and the demonic horde, having disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them. Somebody say amen. 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 I want you to picture a courtroom scene. Some of us have served on juries. Other of us have not. Some of us have been on trial. Others of us not. But we've seen it on TV, if nothing else. Picture a great courtroom scene. In this courtroom scene, God is there. God is there. He is the judge of judges. He is the one who sits behind the judgment bar. 
He sits behind the judge's bench and God alone knows. He alone knows better than you and I the total extent of our sins and our guilt. He already knows. The judge is there, but there's another person in this courtroom. The devil is there. The devil walks into the courtroom and he is our prosecutor. He is our accuser of the brethren. He is there and he shows up to make his case against us as though he reminds God that the wages of sin is death. He tells the judge, you judge, you said it. You cannot deny it. You said that in the day they sin they will die. He reminds God that if I have to spend eternity in hell for my sins, the devil, he says, why should they be exempt? Why shouldn't they have the same penalty that I? have. The devil is there. Our prosecutor. All of our brothers and sisters, Christ is there. Yeah. And he walks our defense attorney. And he not only walks in, he walks up to our side, the one of the uh, one that the one that is justly accused. And our defense attorney takes his side beside us. He listens to the accuser make his case against us. And he addresses the bench. And our attorney says, Father, I have already taken the accusations and the charges against them. Mm -hmm. And I nailed it to the cross. Yeah. Amen. I nailed it to the cross. Do you not know that whenever, go ahead, whenever a criminal, whenever a criminal was crucified on the cross by Rome, there was always the charge written above them that they were being crucified for. Remember how Pilate had inscribed above the head of Jesus, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Therefore, Pilate was signifying this is the crime that he is being crucified for. He claimed to be a king. God, that's the imagery that Paul's using here. I want you to see the beauty of it. He wants you to see above the name that are written above Jesus, the accusation. There's a great cosmic bulletin board with your name on it. And on that bulletin board is every sin you've ever committed. I don't even know all the sins I've committed. I've lost count of them long ago. But everyone is recorded there. And He wants you to see that, that every one of your sins are listed above the head of Jesus. They're all there. And in the courtroom, Jesus says, I nailed that to the cross to let you pay in for Oh, that is such good news. And the accusation of our prosecuting attorney, oh, devil himself, all empty and void. And at that moment, Jesus Christ makes a public spectacle out of him. Oh, brothers and sisters, we need to understand today from God's viewpoint, Jesus' victory on the cross at the same time brought judgment on the old snake, the devil, and he was defeated when Jesus cried, Celestia. Yeah. The devil is finished now. Did you hear that, church? The devil is finished now. Yeah. His suffering is finished. His sacrifice is finished. The devil is finished. And praise God, the last thing that was finished is that sinners are assured of heaven. Yeah. Amen. This is where it gets really good. Amen. Sinners are assured of heaven. How many of us go through life caring about guilt? How many of us who claim to be in Jesus Christ, who claim to be saved, go through our lives caring about guilt of the things that we've done in the past? Well, I talk to them all the time. I know Jesus saved me, but oh, you don't know what I did. I want to ask you a question. The day that Jesus died, in the moment he cried out, Telestia, I want to ask you a question. How many of your sins were still yet future when Christ died? Well, the answer is obvious, isn't it? All of them. You weren't even born yet. What about the sins as you sit here today that you've not committed yet? What about the sins if you're a believer in Jesus that you're going to commit tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that? How many of them have been committed when Jesus died for you and gave this triumphant shout? Again, the answer is obvious. None of them have been committed. They're in the future. Yet we can rejoice in the security of our salvation if we have come to the point of our life where we came to the end of ourselves, we became spiritually bankrupt, and we turned from our sins, and we turned to Jesus, we made Him Lord of our life, and we were born again. We can rest in the assurance of our salvation. Telestial means heaven is your home. Yeah. It can't be taken away.
way. The writer in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 says, every, pre every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But He, Jesus, watch this now, somebody's going to get happy. <laughs> Having offered one sacrifice of sins for all time. Yeah. Sat down. It was finished. Amen. Yeah. That priest had sat down. He didn't need to stand anymore. It is finished. Yeah. And it's finished for all time. He sat down at the right hand of God for by one offering he has perfected seven for all time those who are being <laughs> sanctified. So I want to ask you today. Very, very seriously. What have you done? What guilt are you carrying around? You who are here and you look at your life and you have fruit of being saved. What guilt are you carrying around? And there's people here today, you're not saved. If you was to die right now, heaven would not be your home. If you were to die right now, you have absolutely no assurance of salvation. And right now, in a few moments, we're going to give you a chance to have that assurance, to accept Jesus as Savior. But right then, the Satan's going to start bringing up things against you. So what have you done today? Abortion? Statistically, there's people here that's had an abortion. Sexual immorality? Sure. Sinicide. What have you done today? Cheating? Stealing? Selfishness? Lying? Lust? Adultery? Idolatry? <coughs> what is it that Satan's trying to use to bind you in the darkness? Brothers and sisters, no matter what you've done, if you're in Jesus Christ today, no matter what you ever will do, just go ahead right now. Write in the ledger, paid in full. <coughs> paid in full. Paid in full. You say, well, I'm not a vile sinner, really. You would think that if you don't keep the most important law, that that would make you a vile sinner. Would you not agree with me? And the most important law in all the Bible, Jesus says, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and with all thy soul. <coughs> Can I tell you, I tried, but I never pulled that one off. Mm -hmm. Is it any wonder that the Bible says that all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God? Oh, church, today as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table, as we prepare our hearts to receive Christ, as we prepare our hearts for Easter a week from today, I am so thankful that we have a real Savior that saves from real sin, aren't we? <coughs> I'm so thankful that I can stand before God's judgment on that day and I can say the songs of the old hymn Upon a life that I did not live. Upon a death I did not die. Upon a death, upon a life, I cast my soul eternally. Oh, what a joy. To stand up for God and not to have to give an account for my sins and just say I cast myself on what Jesus did on the cross. I'm banking on those words being true. It is finished. And my appeal to you today, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I urge you to do that right now. Oh, beloved, let me tell you something. I was a vile sinner. I was good at it. I, I, I was really good at it. And I, I knew better. But I thought I'd have more fun in life if I just went my own way and, and lived life for me and, and not for God. Oh, but brothers and sisters, when God brought me to salvation and I received Jesus Christ and I received the burdens of my sins lifted away and I received the gift of the Holy Spirit, I tell you, if I wasn't saved, I'd get up and run right now to the altar. You'll find that Satan's been lying to you. 
You've never known life until you've known it washed in the blood of Jesus. Yes. And I want you to understand something today as Alan comes. The greatness of your sins is not the issue. We all are great sinners. Yes. The issue is the greatness of the sacrifice mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ for you. And if you die and you go to hell, you will go to hell thumbing your nose at the greatness of His sacrifice. At the end of the day, it's the payment that Jesus made. Amen? Yeah. At the end of the day, as we come to the sanctity of this moment, at the end of the day, it was a payment that Christ made that saves, not my lifestyle. Oh, it changed after I met Jesus. You better believe it. But I'm still not perfect, and neither are you. At the end of the day, it's what Christ did that saved. There's nothing left that you can do. So I'm going to be honest with you today. You who are here and you're not saved. You can stand before God at Judgment Day, and you can stand in that courtroom scene that we talked about, and you can stand there on the basis of your own record. You are free to do that today. To walk away and reject this free gift. You're free to do that. But I want you to know this if that's the choice you make. If you do that. You will find your one day in front of the judge of judges. And you will hear the sentence. Depart from me you work of iniquity. I know you not. And you will be cast into outer darkness into a lake of fire called hell. And you will spend all eternity in punishment for your sins. And throughout all eternity you'll never be able to say it is finished. It will never be finished. Because you see Jesus did for you in six hours on the cross what no human being can do throughout all eternity <laughs> in hell. He and only He could make that payment. And we're going to have a moment of response and then we'll do the Lord's table after that. But for you who are here and you're saved, what is it you're carrying around? What is it about it is finished that you don't have settled in your heart? I want you to settle that as you prepare your hearts to receive the Lord's table. The altar is open for you. If you need to come, you come. If you need to pray in preparation, you come. But oh, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, would you come? Well, you say, well, what do I need to do, preacher? You, you repent of your sins. That means you turn from them. And not just turn from your sins, but you embrace Jesus and you make Him Lord of your life. That means you're going to live for Him the best you can. He'll give you the power to do that. And then you take what Jesus did on the cross and trust in that and nothing else. You believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. The Bible says God will save you right now. Right here. Right now. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask you to stand. I tell you what, better yet, I'm going to pray and ask you to stay seated. I just want out to play. Let's just take a moment as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's day. Let's just take a moment. But if you're here and you don't know the Lord, right now, God's speaking to you. You need to come. Would you pray with me? Father God, as we stay with bowed heads in the quietness of this moment, Right now, Father, the Holy Spirit's going through every row, every seat, every heart. And God, every person here that's open to the truth, the Holy Spirit is saying and speaking to them right now. Father, I don't want to get in your way. I'm going to get out of your way. But Father, I pray right now that you would give every person the courage to embrace whatever the Holy Spirit is speaking to the end of their lives right now. For those who are here that need salvation, that you would give them the courage to step out and to come. Father, there's just something about stepping out and coming that drives you stake in the ground. We ask you to do that, Father. For those who are here are carrying about guilt, God, would you wash that away through the blood of Jesus. 
for those who are here and are suffering disease. Father, I pray that you rekindle that spark of hope that one day they can say it's finished. We'll praise you in Jesus' name.